first chemistry education named a future leader in chemistry in 2019 by CAS, a division of the American Chemical Society. Her intersectional identity as a queer immigrant woman of colour in STEM education fields, she's acutely aware of the limitations of quantitative data analysis and its criticism. So we're going to hear more about this in my journey to Quantcrit, how the scientists met the fugitive in the borderlands. OK, so now I share. Can everybody see my slide? Yeah, we can see it fine. Cool, perfect. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so thank you all for being here for my talk and for inviting me. Uh, before I start, I want to make a note that I'm currently at the University of Michigan, who's standing in colonized uh, Potawatomi land. And as an immigrant in this land known as the United States, I'm participating in settler colonialism and I'm part and complicit on the current um, and past uh, erasure of indigenous identities and their genocide. So I invite all of you to research whether you are standing um, in colonized land or uh, if you belong to a country that was part of the colonization of uh, indigenous lands to educate yourselves about uh, the history. Um, okay, <clears throat> sorry, still really early. Let's go. On my first year as a grad student, I was part of a project and this project was supposed to give a presentation in front of an advisory board. For those of no, for for those of you who have never heard of board, that means that in the U.S., when you are, have a grant, part of the National Science Foundation, uh, you make a board of experts that um, are going to be checking on you a couple of times through the project uh, to make sure the project is going in the direction uh, you proposed. And this is to ensure there's some sort of evaluation process uh, that is independent of the researchers. So we were supposed to show uh, our progress to this group of people that are, were really important in the field of science and math education. And my advisor said, hey, you've been doing a lot of work this first year as a grad student and you have a really cool result that is going to end up on a paper. What do you want to present in front of them? And I was really excited, right? Because that meant my advisor was trusting me with an important part of this meeting. So that day I stood up, uh, I was all dressed up, and I presented to this room of like about 10 people uh, and I started talking to them about my project. At the end of the talk, I took a deep breath uh, because I have done it right, like I have managed to get through it um, and asked, are there any questions? One of the professors that was part of the advisory board raised their hand um, and so I said, yes, of course, what is your question? And um, they turn around, look at the, my advisor and proceeded to ask him the question. My advisor looked confused um, and instead of answering, he pointed that like I've done the project and that they should direct the questions to me. So the person um, just looked at me without even rephrasing the question. Uh, like in fact, he just had found out that I was in the room and I answered because what was I supposed to do in that moment, right? This action actually got repeated several times. So no matter how many times my advisor uh, told them that they were supposed to direct the questions to me, um, they first directed them at him. And once he sort of gave the OK that the grad student was able to answer, they will just look at me expecting me to answer. I kept my smile up because again, what are you supposed to do, right? Uh, but when was this happening, um, the thoughts that were going through my head were that I had failed, that that trust my advisor had put on me um, was a mistake, that probably my accent was too thick, that maybe my presentation skills were terrible, that it showed that I didn't know enough statistics to be able to present these results correctly, and that's why people didn't trust me to be able to give a good answer. But, you know, you just need to like keep going, right? Uh, later that day, we went for dinner with them and I was at a table with a couple of them and one of the percent, one of the people in the advisory board uh, looked at me and said, hey, you're from Mexico, right? 
And I was like, yay, uh, yes. Um, and I thought she was getting interested on me and how I ended up there. So I talked really excitedly about how I was a uh, alumni of the National University of Mexico, that I was part of the School of Chemistry, that I spent most of my time among chemists, uh, that I was a researcher that spent like three years doing organic chemistry. And that picture is an actual picture of my bench uh, when I was in undergrad. Um, that I had done, I have worked so hard that I was even part of a publication, even though if I was like the fifth author in it, right? And those six were my babies. And that I had an honors undergraduate thesis on a different topic uh, where I completed a small synthesis. But turns out she was not interested in that. She said, no, 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 I mean, I'm asking because I'm just surprised you like doing statistics. And I was like, how come? It's like, well, you're Mexican. And she said it with so much certainty, like if it was obvious that I wouldn't know why a Mexican girl would not be expected to do statistics. And I was like, well, I don't understand it. She's like, well, you know, you need to be good at math to be statistics and you're Mexican. Again, she said it so matter of factly. Um, and I think I understood back then why she reacted like that and why she was doing that. I also didn't understand back then why nobody in that table stopped her and told her that this was an inappropriate conversation. You see, uh, when we work in education related to science and math, no matter if we're doing it in elementary school, middle school, college, high school, uh, we tend to see data constantly repeated in papers, right? And one of the things you may see repeated constantly is this idea that SATs predict our uh, abilities to do uh, science in college. And the SATs are the standardized test that is used in the United States. And so if you look at the SAT math scores uh, across people, right? I'm showing you here a graph between white and Latinx um, students. Um, and you look at women, right, a female students, right, uh, males that are white are going to score above the 50th percentile. But Latinx females are going to score under the 30th percentile. And so looking at this graph, if you see this repeatedly, constantly across research over and over and over again, the way your brain is going to code this sort of information is this. If the 50th percentile is the minimum score you will be expecting somebody to get, and so we mark that as a zero in this graph. So imagine this zero is a 50th percentile, which is a score of 520. You start thinking about wild males as people that score above it, on average 31 points above this 520. And Latinx females as minus 58. Another thing that kept happening when she was asking me this question was whether my parents went to grad school or whether STEM researchers or studied STEM or were in med school. And I said, no, they were neither of these things. And she was even more surprised, like, wait, you're Mexican, you're good at math, and your parents are not even in STEM. Um, the reason she asked this is because um, analysis show that, like, if my parents are in STEM, went to med school, went to grad school, uh, you would get a bump on this course, right? And so the average score would be that of 522. It was really hard for me to process this night for many reasons not only for the blatant racism of all the interactions, but I grew up in Mexico. Um, and I grew up fairly privileged. You can see my skin, I'm light skin. And in Mexico, racism exists as in any other country. So if you're light skin, on average, you will get more years of education. You will have higher um, socioeconomic status, et cetera, right? So I, I grew up very privileged. I grew up like a princess. And so to me, being raised in all this privilege where people never question whether I could do things or not, was hard to come to the United States and be racialized. And so that means that when I came to the United States, it was like if people were looking at me through a brown glass and suddenly I was not a Mexican princess and suddenly I was not the privileged girl, right? I was just an immigrant that was brown and that was not supposed to be good at math. And these two things were really shocking to me because I needed to like merge my perception of reality with the perception of reality of people around me. A perception of reality that is built on past ideas about how Mexicans are, uh, current ideas of immigrants due to policies that are imposed in the United States, 
past representations in media and current representations in media. What this night did to me back in grad school was that it cemented my idea that I wanted to study something that would help people stay in science despite this racism. And so I became really obsessed with this idea of science identity. I was a scientist. I identify myself as a scientist. I identify myself as a chemist, right? I still think in chemists that I ascribe to myself and I said I am like them, right? Uh, I am, by the way, that's a picture of me in college uh, with other um, classmates. And yes, they're all male because like engineering. Um, and, you know, when you go into the community and the science community and you don't get accepted, then you ask yourself, should I be here? Because if all the other people are seeing me and they think I cannot do math, I cannot be here. Was I making a mistake ascribing these characteristics? So I thought back then that if I studied this topic hard enough, I could find a way of buffering this lack of acceptance. So science identity would not be broken. And I spent all grad school studying things like intellectual resources, students' knowledge, student scientific sense making, their effective resources like interests, competencies, and beliefs. Um, and I got to the conclusion that a lot of the change didn't need to happen in the students, but needed to happen in the learning environment. Um, so my postdoctoral research started to focus on that, on like the types of things we can do in a learning environment to make these changes, right? Is it like part of the curriculum? Is it part of the teacher training, etc.? But I stumble into a theoretical and methodological problem. The problem is when I tried to study the learning environment and the intellectual resources of students, I could not find a theory or a method that would allow me to account for chemistry culture and systemic oppression, right? So how do I account for the things that we're expected to do because we're chemists, like those type of behaviors, like we do labs because we're chemists and we do labs, and this is, I know, a joke, uh, but also like sort of this ideas of who gets and who doesn't get to belong in science and in chemistry as a whole. So for example, another thing that like it's really hard to account theoretically is ideas like uh, that your advisors expect you to do when you're doing research, right? So all of these are letters that advisors in chemistry have sent to their students at some point, either as part of their rule book in their research group or like personal letters. You may be familiar with a couple of them. But you will know that some of these things are like emphasizing this idea that you need to be here a thousand hours a week. You need to be reading all the time. You should not have free time, right? Like the bare minimum, right? And if you're not willing to do this bare minimum, you're not supposed to be here. And we code these things as part of what it is like to be a chemist. But this is actually not part of being a chemist. The scientific method never had a note that said that you needed to work 80 hours in order to be a scientist. This is something that is called actually epistemic ignorance and epistemic ignorance are a specific things that people in power have put in place as this is what we do, right? In order to create barriers so other people that are not like them cannot become scientists. And so things like that are not only these kinds of rules, but it's like things like the GRE, which is another standardized test that you use to get into grad school. It is the type of things we tell people about whether we're surprised that they're smart or articulated or like your English is great, um, where you're supposed to just, you know, not say anything. Uh, and the way we have been raised to perceive scientists, media and um, et cetera. So how, what, where do you go from here when you realize the theories and methods you have around you are not enough to study a problem? Well, that is when you need to find a new place, right? And this is the place that I'm calling the borderlands in honor of Gloria and Saldua. And so I propose this framework that is called the Resources for Equitable Activation of Chemical Thinking Framework, or REACT. Um, and in this framework, what I did originally was say, OK, we need to account for different things, right? We need to account for what the student can bring in into the classroom. We need to account for what the instructor does and how the curriculum is designed. We need to account for what the university context and mission is. So different universities have different missions. Uh, there's Hispanic serving institutions that are supposed to be focused on serving Latinx students. 
you have primarily undergrad institutions that are focused on developing undergrads. You have research one institutions that are more focused on producing research, right? And those sort of missions and contexts will create policies that sort of constrain what teachers can or cannot do in the classroom. And finally, we need to also account for the culture, right? And so this is um, all built on theory on different ways some people have talked about things in the past. And now what I'm doing is working on uh, proving each part empirically and then all of it as a whole. And so now the next thing to think about as part of this framework is how do we account for the fact that we can come to science and be really excited, but then once we're introduced to it, we're expected to assimilate into several things, including the epistemic ignorance and become this cookie cutter version of what a chemist is. So what this framework proposes is that instead of doing this, we need to create a thing that is called epistemological border crossing in which we allow students that come with marginalized identities to be able to access the chemistry knowledge, the chemistry sense making, the chemistry um, culture, right? The things that are actually chemistry and help them negotiate the things that are just invented to keep people away. And by advocating for them and working with them, what we're going to do is push these boundaries of what it means to be a chemist in a way that they're no longer in a border crossing and negotiating, but in a way that it becomes that a chemist is somebody that also looks like this and has these identities. So this solved my theoretical problem, or I try to solve it the best I could. Uh, but now we go to the problem of the methodology. So I'm a quantitative researcher. I love numbers. Um, and the problem that I realized we had as quantitative people is that in our um, fun, so when we were looking to be accepted by chemists and by scientists as chemistry education researchers, we fell into this cycle of doing quantitative methods uh, in a really positivist way where we pretend that we could be objective about it. And by this, I mean that we look for an achievement gap, right, where people are failing, quote unquote. We simplify the model. We go measure some stuff, plug the data into our studio or whatever statistical software it's of your liking. We publish a paper, we pat ourselves on the back, and we move on to the next thing. And I'm culpable of this thing. So I'm not saying all of this to shame people. I'm sharing this because I realize the things I've done in the past were hurtful and can be hurtful for marginalized populations. And I want to invite all of you to be reflexive about it. So I'm going to show you how I've done this in the past. I found an achievement gap. So this was again based on SAT math differences in chemistry. Uh, well, SAT math differences and how it affected students' uh, performance in chemistry in general, chemistry one. Uh, so I simplified my model, right, in this paper called the effect of math SAT and women's chemistry competency beliefs. So what I said is, okay, students that are women are gonna take this SAT math scores and they're gonna take them to heart more than men. So that means that if you get a lower score, you're gonna say, oh, that means I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be a scientist, right? Uh, and that is going to impact students' uh, general chemistry one scores. So there's two problems with this model that I simplified. The first one is that I'm coding this as gender, right? Women will take this scores to heart, right? Instead of saying, because of sexism, right? Uh, girls have been socialized to think they're not good at math to begin with. So ergo, when the SAT math corroborates this idea, um, they're going to be like, oh my God, everything that people have been telling me all my life is true. So first thing is that, right, my simplified model is not accounting for the model, for the actual process correctly. The second thing is that even though I did ask students to be, uh, to identify on their true gender, uh, I had to remove people that, I, that are trans and non-binary because the sample was too small. So that means that my simplified model and my results are effectively erasing a population and not accounting for their experiences. Uh, and population that has been more marginalized than me, right? In many ways. And so third, the other thing I did was that I wrote things like the effect of gender in. And by saying the effect of gender in, I'm coding this as if gender is a biological genetic thing, right? that has an effect on things when it's true, we know that gender is a social construct and that even if we were going to use the word sex, sex is more complex than just a binary of female and male and that actually being female or male or intersex 
has no association with your cognitive abilities. So using words that like the effect of gender in is reifying things in a hurtful way. And this posed a problem for me and my identity, right? I said, as I am a quantitative researcher, I love numbers is something that has always been a really important part of myself. But quantitative methods were pushing me to aim to be this objective, quote unquote, true truth, right? And if I didn't lived up to these standards of truth, where I tried, where I needed to separate myself, not only from my experiences, but, but the experience that people were telling me about, I was being a bad scientist. But on the other side, people that are qualitative and critical theorists will tell me that my problem was that I was trying to use the master's truths tools to solve, to fix the problem and that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I should never and I will never disagree with other Lord and neither should you. So I had to question myself. Does that mean that I need to drop quantitative methods because I'm using the master's tools? Well, it turns out that I realized the master's tools are not numbers, it's actually white supremacy. So it's not that I can use numbers, it's that the way we're currently used numbers was a problem. And so this led me to figure out a way in which we needed to disassociate quantitative methods from their history of white supremacy. And there is a ton of white supremacy in the history of quantitative methods. So I'm going to just give you a brief history just to illustrate this. Uh, there's this guy that was named Francis Galton. He was very Victorian and by very Victorian, I mean, uh, you know, he was really fancy. He was really rich and he loved two things in life. Uh, he loved Charles Darwin, the origin of species book, and he loved charts. A thing he loved to do when doing charts is uh, he loved to make like a tree of genealogy of his family and mark the men, emphasis on men, that were brilliant. And I think he discovered while doing this charts is that he was a cousin of Darwin. And look and behold, when he looked at how the Darwin and Galton family intermarried each other, more brilliant men, emphasis on men again, uh, were produced. And so this gave him the idea that he could apply Darwin's ideas of in the origin of species to actually study people. And so he started creating uh, mathematical methods to do so. He actually invented a method that we use currently that is called linear regression. And he started using it first just to look at whether children uh, had similar heights as their parents, right? Uh, so that is one of the ways in which we de he developed this methodology. But he's also very famous for another thing. Actually, he's more famous for this other thing than inventing regression. Very few people know he's the one who invented regression. Um, he's very famous because he's the founder of a field called eugenics. He founded the society, the journal, the theories, everything. He's like the father of eugenics. And as the father of eugenics and a scientist, that means these ideas didn't stay with him. This means his ideas were propagated through the people he mentored. One of these people was a name, a person named Carl Pearson that you may have heard about. And Carl Pearson uh, believed that statistics should be the grammar of science. Right, that it should be embedded in everything we do, and that that is what would allow us to get to the quote unquote truth. And so he developed the Pearson correlation, as you may have figured out by now, but he also ran one of the first dedication studies in history. So I'm going to talk to you about that study. He was also really uh, interested in gaps. Obviously, the SAT math didn't exist back then, so he actually created a scale of intelligence. And this scale of intelligence was uh, scored in a way that 100 will mean you have average intelligence. And if you're lower than 100, that means you are below the average. And he went to schools and he first went to white kids and measured white kids uh, intelligence score. And he, they got a score of 96.8 and 90.3 respectively between males and females. And you know, they're closer they're close to 100. These are kids. They're still developing. So Carl Pearson was like, you see, white kids have average intelligence. Everything's good with the world. And then he went to a school of Jewish immigrants and he introduced his test again, a test that he created already believing that the white race was supreme. And what he found through this test was that uh, Jewish people uh, had very low scores of intelligence. 
And so he wrote in his paper that the effect of race in IQ proved that um, on average and regarding both sexes, the alien Jewish population is somewhat inferior physically and mentally to the native British population. And after the study that he published in the Annals of Eugenics, he actually proposed to the government to create a policy where Jewish immigrants should be forbidden to enter uh, the British Empire because they were not sending their best people. Um, and any coincidence with present things saying in the world, or even my own study where I said that the effect of gender leads to things, is not coincidental. It is because this is the way quantitative methods were developed and the language we have been using comes from here, right? And so we need to actually be reflective and accept that positivism is actually not objective. Positivism is a philosophy that, yes, in theory, aim to uh, get to truth, but actually was built and developed along white supremacy, the same as this quantitative methods. And the only way in which we're going to be able to separate white supremacy from quantitative methods is that we move from a philosophy of positivist, positivism, where there's only one objective truth, to a theory, for a, to a philosophy of criticalism, where we acknowledge their systems of power embedded in the way we do stuff, and that we have biases as people that we bring into our research. And that means using theories of people that we would not have thought before because we're scientists in order to inform the way we do quantitative methods. And so what does this mean? I know I've talked a lot about theory and like this is a lot of information and I recognize that. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about how this looks a little bit in practice. So what does this mean? So this means first that when you're doing a study that is using quantitative methods, you need to first contextualize systems of oppression. Uh, so I think that is really in vogue right now is that institutions are giving are allowing researchers to get access to their institutional data, right? And so people are really excited because that means we can get access to not not only current and past data, we can actually be studying students in um, real time and use this institutional data to try to figure out problems in education. However, this requires us to accept that this is that we're built around a system of oppression. And this means that students came to college after going through an education system that is segregated in the United States, right? So in the United States, schools are funded through taxes uh, based on your property. So the more rich that is the neighborhood you are, the more money a school will have to, to provide resources for kids. People that are in poor neighborhoods are paying lower taxes, so that means less money. That means schools are less funded. And these schools are the ones students are going to go through until K 12, like through 12 years, right? Until they get to college. And that is going to affect the types of knowledge they have, the type of resources they have had, and the type of like uh, supports they've had in their life. So first thing, contextualize it, right? When we're using this data, we need to accept this and that the things we're looking at are affected by the system. The second thing we need to do is to rearrange from individual to system level. So I think that is really also that we like to do and that I used to do a lot too as a researcher in the past is that we acknowledge that students uh, that are marginalized had to go through certain obstacles. And so we focused on trying to develop grit or interest or persistence, right? Uh, in a way to support them. And that then we would say, well, some students are not persistent enough, are not great enough, are not interested enough. And this is, just think about it for a second, right? We're basically blaming students for not having the energy to go through obstacles multiple times in their days and in their lives, right? And so when they wake up and when they when they give up, quote unquote, or when they decide that this is not the road they wanna keep going through, we blame it on their grit, on their personal things, when it's actually us that should be breaking down the barriers. So that means that we need to rearrange things from individual to system level and go to a place in which as mentors, as teachers, as people, as researchers, we need to look for ways in which we get to support students' intellectual resources in the classroom or in the lab, but at the same time advocate for them and change structures outside and break them, right? And this requires us to build research questions that are not so centered into individuals, but also into the structure and question the structure and change the structure. 
The, the third thing you need to do whenever you're dealing with data, and I'm still going to be talking about uh, institutional data as an example, is that we need to ground whatever data we're using in the socio-historical context. So the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Britain uh, actually invested in slavery from 1600, 1660 to 1700. And I know this is totally shocking that in the 1600s, uh, as society, in the British Empire was investing in slavery. But this also means that we need to recognize the people we admire, like Robert Boyle, who was a president of the Royal Society at the time, were complicit on this thing, right? He was part of the people who decided that the Royal Society should invest on slavery in order to get money to fund research. And ergo, the research that has not only funded through this period, but in later periods, thanks to the richness and the uh, and the money that was produced through this investment in slavery, right? It's connected to that, and we cannot separate it. Uh, another thing, for example, related to institutional data, is understanding the history of standardized tests. The history of standardized tests is tightly connected to eugenics. So Carl Brehm was a eugenicist openly. He had published about eugenics. He told everybody he was an eugenicist, and he believed the white race was superior. And the college board hired him to develop a test. And that test is the SAT. So to be super clear, the SAT, the standardized test that the college board applies today to determine who gets to go to college in the United States, was designed by an openly eugenics, eugenicist person that believed the white race is superior. And this is a test that we're still using today. And nothing has changed in the SAT since then to actually remove the things that make the test white supremacist. And so when we're doing data institutionally or in our research and we're using SAT as a control, right, or as a predictor, what does that mean? And finally, um, we need to elevate and under marginalized voices and acknowledge the limitations of quantitative methods. And by this, I mean that when you're building results using statistics, you need to really question yourself whether uh, the way you're interpreting the results is accounting for all the things that I've been talking about, but it's also accounting for the things that we know in qualitative data that marginalized populations have said. So we can actually use quantitative, qualitative data to support our quantitative methods and interpretation. And that is something that I'm inviting you to do in the future, because that would allow you right, to do quantitative methods in a way that is respectful of the things that people have experienced. And we need to start criticizing quantitative projects that are not being reflexive or critical of their history, of the past, and that are just refining constant histories and stories about how certain people are not supposed to be doing science. I want to thank uh, my co-authors on this work that were uh, still working on this theory paper, uh, Dr. Catherine Husbein, postdoc at Eastern Carolina University, and Dr. Vanessa Ralph, postdoc at University of Wisconsin-Madison. They're my scholar sisters. And thanks to them, I wake up every day knowing that I get to work with people that share my values and that I'm doing something to change um, current hurtful things on, on the way we do science. And Megan Deshea, she's a grad student at the Ryan Stowe Lab and University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we've been mentoring her through this project as well. I also want to acknowledge uh, past and present uh, mentors and advisors, Dr. Christian Shin, my PhD advisor, Dr. Kevin Binning, my postdoc advisor at the University of Pittsburgh, and Dr. Tim McKay, uh, my current postdoc advisor at University of Michigan. And finally, I want to uh, thank the CAEX Future Leaders in Chemistry Program of the American Chemical Society for all the resources they have provided me in order to become a better presenter and to share my research um, with people. And follow me on Twitter if you're interested on in continuing this conversation. So now, how do I stop sharing? Um, wait, here, no, stop sharing. Are we back? Yep. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. Um, would, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Madeline Schultz has got her hand up. 
Yeah. Paulette, how are you? Fine, and you? Yeah, not too yeah. bad. Congratulations on your new home. And um, yeah. fantastic talk. I uh, just really, really great talk. So well done. Uh, just really thought provoking and well, well, just so well presented and so great that you can share your personal journey like that. Um, I'm have this is, you know, links it in a very small way when um, when I decided that it wasn't appropriate to ask our second year organic chemistry students to do an assignment to um, do named reactions. Like I just feel like the named reactions of organic chemistry, doesn't that like epitomize? I looked and looked and looked and there's apparently one named after a female because when the students say which reaction should I go, I just I'll pick the one with the same last name as you. Well, how many of my students have a last name that has a named reaction? Right. So I, I'm just reflecting on that and um, it's great. No, I appreciate that because it's true. Like name reactions are like the way in which we keep like idealizing people that were actually not great advisors either. Right. And and so like and like and so like um and they're all, all white males, right? Mostly. Uh and so it's it's just we create keep telling students, right? These are the brilliant people, these are the like people that do things. Um so yeah, no, that is actually a great way of like thinking about also how the context uh affects things. Uh I, I'm seeing that Alina has a question. Um and so Alina is asking in the chat, what are some ways we can prioritize and represent marginalized voices with quantitative data? Call person asking, and I love this question, Alina. Um, I a lot of these things I've been figuring out as we go, and we've been figuring out as we go because this is something very new, right? Um, so way in which we're uh, experimenting with this is one triangulation of data, right? So if you're doing a mixed methods project with triangulation of data, is is the easiest way to merge both, right? Because then you will be able to take quotes or things that you found in the qualitative data to explain some of the phenomena you use in quant. So that is a straightforward answer, right? But I think the other way in which we can do it is that when we find a problem in data, so like, and by problem I say, like, let's say a gap, quote unquote, even though I don't like that language, but it's in the language that we all can understand, right? We need to dig deeper, right? And instead of thinking about the traditional explanations of that, Let's think about things that qualitative data has said and, and look at whether we can find evidence of that. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm part of a project currently and the professor that I'm working with, he found that black students were scoring lower on this class, right? And the traditional explanation would be, well, they come less prepared, uh, right? So that's why they're doing less good. And so he was not satisfied with this traditional explanation. He brought me on the project and we started scratching the surface, right? And so what we found was the students were scoring equally good no matter who they were on the final exam. So they had the knowledge, right? But the final grade was accounting for things that were depending on attendance. So this was a flipped classroom. And so you needed to also do the sessions on the flipped classroom, right, to get some credit and some stuff. And black students were less likely to go to the class. And again, the traditional explanation would be, oh, they're lazy. They are not interested. They don't want to go, right? But again, we were not satisfied with that traditional explanation. And so what we knew is that students sometimes don't go to the classroom because they don't feel comfortable, right? Because we're doing something that is hurting them and the space is not safe. So we kept digging, right? Because we knew that qualitative data was telling us this. And we found no evidence that he as a person was not doing, uh, was not creating a safe space. He was really actually worried that he had done something that would make his classroom not safe and welcoming to black students and he was, willing to change. Uh, however, what we found is not him, right? Particularly, it was not him as a person. Turns out that same semester, that college had a huge amount of racist graffiti all over campus. And so think about it from the perspective of a black student. This is a flip class. I can look at the videos from my bedroom, right? I don't need to go and see in the walls all these hurtful things, right? I'm going to just do this. Why would I put myself through the process of leaving my dorm? And so they did the flip side. They learned. They got their grades on the final exam, right? But they didn't go to the class because they didn't felt safe on the institution, right? And so this was the way in which we use qualitative data that has been published prior, right, to this project to try to sort of guide where we were looking for an explanation on the quantitative data. So this is the second way in which we're trying to do it. Uh, this is not a checklist, 
right? Uh, sadly, I wish I could give you all a checklist of like this is all the things you can do to be able to do like great quantitative methods that are critical. Um, the truth is, is that every step of the way we just need to reflect and pause and ask ourselves, right? What is the traditional explanation? What are the things qualitative or critical people have told us? How can I ask this question, right? And be reflexive every step of the way, each step from the beginning to the end, right? Um, and so that would be my way to answer your question, and I hope I answered it in a way that was uh, helpful. OK, thank you. Um, we have time for one last question, if anyone. Yes, Michael. Yeah, uh, Michael. Uh, so I guess I'm interested in genuine explorations of gender or issues associated with gender. So very, I mean, I, I saw from an editor's point of view, very often people would do something and then they'd run it through the gender machine and something would crop up or not and they'd say something about it. And clearly that's one end. Did he go frozen on my side or like am I the problem? No, it's uh, Michael seems to have frozen. Sorry, Michael, you're breaking just, up just a little. Time. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. I'll, I'll turn off my. Uh, uh. Uh, we we heard you okay up to the point where you said shove it in the gender machine. Oh yeah, <laughs> shove it in the gender machine. Um, I no. can like, I can make an inference based on what he was saying though, and I do think that like, what does he mean, right? Like, genuine explorations of gender through quantitative methods, right? Um, and that is a like a question that haunts me every day. Um, I've been reading a book that it's called. Um, starting with gender in higher education so i recommend it to people that are interested in exploring these things um this book was it, it was uh one of these edited books where like authors each different authors write each chapter um and this was actually led by two uh trans and non-binary researchers in higher education so like what by that i mean is that they're starting from their marginalized point of view and that is how they selected the people they have one particular uh, chapter on quantitative methods um about like the ways we ask the question the ways we quantitate like do the quantitative question etc um as somebody that assists right uh i try to listen and defer to what people that are from that community have been saying and sort of like the way it's ended up being on my practices if I cannot include the group on my sample due to uh, numbers, right? I should not, um, the, the way I've, I, I've been like thinking about it both statistically and in, in order to um, honor their existence, right? Is that I'm not removing them from my sample anymore. And when you're doing regressions and et cetera, that population will get super high standard errors and you're not gonna be able to interpret on them. So what you need to do through your paper is say, you know, I'm not going to explicitly, I am not going to read into any of this, right? Because that would be hurtful about trying to um, uh, read into them, impose into them, et cetera, meaning. Uh, the second way in which we need to do is to actually do, uh, yes, is that one, Risa. Um, it's uh, to do qualitative data alongside every time we study gender, because that way we're actually going to be able to honor their experiences, right? Um, and, and now Michael can like finish his question, but I, I think he was going through that uh, lane. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, yeah, no, it was essentially um, if people want to do gender based studies. In, in a way, what I'm getting from your work that actually they need to take a step further back and actually not just go in with that intention, but really question the instruments. So I guess what kind of advice can you offer for people who meaningfully want to do good, but are really challenged by perhaps some of the underlying philosophies of the instruments they may be using? No, I appreciate that. I, 
the way I've been doing it is one read, 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 <laughs> right? Uh, I've been like spending a lot of time reading trans and non-binary uh, literature uh, to understand them. Two, whatever instrument I end up deciding using, then now on my methods, I'm going to do a really a longer way of explaining things. And actually in my website, I have a poster that I made with uh, Katie and with Vanessa about how to talk about social identities. And in that poster, if you see the way we describe the measure of gender, uh, it is long, right? It's longer than we would usually give in a, in, a, in a quantitative paper. But then exactly the reason for that is to honor that idea of uh, how are we defining it? How are we measuring it? What is the history behind this measure? How is this not a perfect representation, right? And so like just be super explicit in the methods and in the paper, right? Because that way people can like, know how much to read into it and not. And finally, the final thing that I that I think we should all be doing is we need to think about who we're recruiting and who we're putting as students to ask those questions, right? Uh, so I'm currently working with a wonderful, wonderful grad student um, who they are doing their thesis in organic chemistry, but like they asked their committee to do a chapter on chemistry education research because they want to move into the field. And so they asked me to be their mentor, and I feel really honored that they trusted me to do this. And I've been guiding them in terms of methodology and theory, right? But I'm le letting them ask the question because this is their community, right? And so when it comes to the idea of gender in their experiences in grad school, which is the thing they're interested in, I am like staying out of the lane. I'm letting them explore and letting them ask because they have lived experience. So I think we need to also start thinking about who we're bringing in to do projects, who we're collaborating with. Are we creating collaborations with people with these identities or are we bringing in students with those identities to lead those things? And I think that is actually really, really important. Um, because as these people, we're never going to be able to understand this, right? And so like, why do we even pretend we can do it without collaborating with them? And this goes to race too and disabilities and uh, any other marginalization. Okay, if you could join me 